Hey there, my name is Cole Von Glan, and welcome to the forum. For just a second before we get started today, I want you to think about maybe your college dorm or your barbershop or a group text, your grandmother's kitchen table. Um, f- for me, it's my friend's alley side back porch. But wherever it is, I want you to think about those places where you have conversations that never stop, where each question leads you to a new topic deeper and deeper down this path, sort of the places where you can be curious out loud. That's how I want to welcome you to the forum. It's the place where the Harris policy community is going to gather to be curious out loud. It's where the conversations that happen and the questions that keep leading us forward are going to be discussed and debated by new hosts every week following their passion, their interest, their drive, the part of their experience that they feel most compelled to share. This week, Graham Harwood, a first year at Harris, will be interviewing Congressman Mike Quigley of Illinois' 5th District on a wide range of topics pertaining to his work on the House Intelligence Committee. I'll be checking back in at the end with a couple more things about how this series is going to shape up moving forward, but for now, I don't want to delay you any further. So please, enjoy the conversation in the forum. Good morning, Congressman Quigley. Congressman Quigley is the representative from Illinois' 5th Congressional District, elected in 2009 after some guy named Rahm Emanuel, vacated for the less prestigious position of White House Chief of Staff. It's since about then, right. <laughs> Less. Uh, since then, Congressman Quigley has served on the House Appropriations Committee and the House Permanent Select Committee for Intelligence, as well as co-founding the Congressional Transparency Caucus and has introduced legislation to strengthen the oversight of all branches of federal government through 21st century technologies. Congressman Quigley attended Roosevelt University and has his master's in public policy from U Chicago and his JD from Loyola University. He has taught intelligence and government at both Loyola University and the University of Chicago most recently teaching contemporary U.S. intelligence at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy this fall. Thank you for being here, Congressman. Glad to be here. Thank you. First, I'd just like to ask if you shed some light on uh, why you teach this class and your view on the importance of including intelligence as part of a public policy curriculum. Yeah, you know, I think initially it's how I came to, you know, and sort of the why came later. Um, You know, we were in the middle of the beginnings of the Russian investigation taking place uh, in 2016, 2017, and uh, what Russia did to attack our democratic process and what we were doing in Congress and more specifically what we were doing on the House Select Committee on Intelligence and that investigation. And I was talking to uh, uh, Mark Farinella, who graduated roughly the same time I did from Harris, at that point called the Committee on Public Policy. And uh, you know, I had guest lectured to students at Harris and I taught before, and we just sort of rattled around the idea of sharing this initially in sort of a lecture or two at different classes. But then it just seemed, seemed like a natural that, hey, you know, maybe you want to teach this. Um, and, you know, and that gets sort of to the why you'd want to teach a class like this. I am not aware of any school in Illinois. Uh, or for that matter, I think the Midwest that that teaches a class specifically on, uh, you know, what this does, the contemporary U.S. intelligence. And I was uh, fortunate to be in a unique position as an alum, someone who had guest lectured and taught, but also serve on the committee in the midst of, of all the things that were going on with intelligence uh, and the intelligence community. So uh, I got a lot of help from um, a lot of folks who are a part of the community uh, sort of putting this together, looked for, you know, syllabus that were used. And in the end, we created something that was very different. You know, and, and back to the why, uh, not available clearly in the Harris School, and it's uh, extremely important. But I also think that students from a program like this, you know, they ought to have as many options as possible in areas that they may not have thought about before, to, to simply have an understanding of what the policy issues are and how to analyze uh, intelligence because it's so important. But also, you know, as a career option, 
and uh, you know, we've had several students in now four years teaching uh, at Harris who have you know gotten into the community and, and engaged with it and has taken it up as a career option. And for others, it sort of solidifies their knowledge in the areas that they want to go uh, anyway. And it is unfortunate. Uh, a lot of folks have said, you know, the East Coast or those schools uh, near Washington, D.C. have sort of a home field advantage. You know, the CIA is right there. Washington, D.C. is right there. And it's unfortunate because the Harris students, uh, I, I would argue that the the way the school teaches policy fits more appropriately for the needs of folks who would serve in the intelligence community. Uh, it's quantitative analysis, analytical basis. You know, I, I think exceeds those of the other schools that, uh, that offer this and feed into the intelligence community. So, you know, we wanted to overcome that home field advantage, offer something else, um, provide opportunities, think about what they might like to do, but, uh, you know, there's something else out there. So some folks, you know, they go into the program knowing exactly what they want to do. Others have their minds change. If at the very least the class has reminded folks there's other things out there to investigate, uh, then I guess it's been worth it. I, I know I can personally identify with that uh, as a former student in the class. Um, and it's clear that you have a, a big passion for the intelligence community. And part of the reason we want to do this is to hear more of your opinions outside of the classroom. The intelligence community has long been seen as kind of an apolitical entity where discussions of politics were simply off limits. Given the erosion of this norm over the years and particularly during the Trump administration, what can we do to codify this norm uh, of an apolitical intelligence community into law? And kind of what would your idealized version of this law be? And what do you see as the barriers to passage of such a law? Yeah, you know, I think it's a series of laws uh, and policies. There's a lot of ways to uh, address the issues of partisanship. But let's remember it's playing out in the intelligence community and in the intelligence committees in the House and the Senate. But the fact is it's symptomatic of a problem our country is facing, polarization, feeds into this partisanship. And in the final analysis, we can pass all the laws we want. We can change all the rules. That will help. But fundamentally, until the country can get past this, uh, I, I think particularly dark period, you know, because in the end, people who serve in the executive branch and the House and the Senate, you know, they're not inventing this partisanship. They come there with you know, I think some view a, a mission to be partisan, right? To go after the other side with no holds barred. So uh, part of this is ad addressing the issue of a country that's so polarized and addressing the issue that which comes from that, uh, the actions as they serve in the executive or legislative branch. Uh, there are some things we can do. <clears throat> you know, the Senate's approach to how they divide the Senate Intelligence Committee no matter who controls by what margin, there's only one vote difference. So uh, in the numbers, Dems versus Republicans or vice versa, that makes it a little harder to be partisan. You know, that might help on the House side. Uh, I think the selection by the leaders of each party of the type of people to serve on the, those committees is important. They already have to pick people who are pretty serious, you know, thoughtful, academic, who are committed to uh, serving the community and their, their constituencies um, and keeping what they're learning uh, as, as it is classified secret, that's important. You know, you know, maybe it makes sense to reinforce from leadership that uh, the committee has to serve as an example to the entire community of um, bipartisan cooperation. It does at times. Now, there are other reforms that would go into protecting this and keeping politics out of that. Some of that has to do with the appointments there, protecting the independence of people who serve in the intelligence uh, community, uh, and, and putting rules in place that protect inspector generals, whistleblowers. Because in the final analysis, the intelligence community operates in a manner that seems 
inherently inconsistent with an open and democratic government, right? We think we believe in openness, but it's really hard to function in a very dangerous world without good intelligence. It's really hard to get good intelligence if we're not protecting sources and methods. So, you know, those two inherently seemingly contradictory issues run into each other, but, you know, we can overcome that. But inspector generals, whistleblowers, they matter in a democracy. They really matter uh, in the intelligence community in a democracy so that we can meet that challenge of these conflict, seemingly conflicting uh, circumstances and, and still get the job done. So uh, I think there can be protections in place and incentives to keep this from being as partisan, protecting those who you know, let us know about wrongdoing, at the same time protecting those who serve from an executive branch at its whim saying, well, we're gonna get rid of you because you disagree with us on policy. Just to circle back on one thing you mentioned, in particular, the kind of appointments. I know that you're in the House, and so you have less of an um, advice and consent. Role. We're spectators. Ah, uh, yes. Um, but do you, do you have any thoughts? I know there's been a lot of both state and defense roles that have been held up in the current Senate. Do you have any thoughts on if there is a better policy for that, or if that's simply we have to solve our partisanship issues? That's a large part of it. You know, the, the Constitution's really important. Laws are really important. It, but it's hard to regulate norms, right? I don't know that the founding fathers assumed that people would, they don't necessarily violate the Constitution, but it's just not something you do, right? I mean, you move forward on appointments and you fill them on a timely basis. You can vote any way you want, but uh, I'm not sure this and all the other circumstances that slow down appointments were necessarily taken into consideration. And it's only one of a multitude of examples of norms are more important than the Constitution. How we treat each other, how we respect each other, how we respect a, a democracy is fundamental. And uh, again, I think that gets back to civics education and this country getting back to uh, a mutual respect for each other and our democratic norms. I mean, I, I think we can all hope for a better future with that. Um, moving on, uh, much has been made in recent years of encryption and going dark. As to say, if bad actors use electronic forms of communication that are end-to-end -end encrypted, such as impossible for law enforcement or intelligence entities to be able to access the content of messages, how do you think about the balance between maintaining privacy for av average citizens of communication and also maintaining the security of the American people? And what are your thoughts on a policy solution to be able to figure out how to draw those lines? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to divide it a little bit because it's a different set of circumstances domestically than internationally. You know, but the, before we get to that, I mean, the threat is real. It's getting cheaper and easier to go dark, to encrypt, uh, to make things hard for anybody to find out, uh, even with the so-called key that the telecommunication company or the platforms might have. So uh, there is a real challenge, and I think it's profound on a domestic basis for a variety of reasons. Uh, but I think former CIA director said it best. We've got to decide, and the FBI director said basically the same thing. We've got to decide what kind of country we're going to have here. Are we going to let people who would do grave damage to our country go free? Are we going to have the, at least the ability to find out these things? You know, we pretty much always could in the past, and we had cooperation. And, and you mentioned the balance, and the balance is important. Uh, as a criminal defense attorney for 10 years, full time, 17 altogether, you know, I worked on that balance and, uh, you know, had my Fourth Amendment treaties in front of me. And I think that balance is still there. But if there's no access, uh, that's a dangerous thing. There ought to be due process to get this information. It ought to work within the bounds of the Constitution. Uh, but if we don't have that, you know, this is going to be a very, very dangerous place. So in the final analysis, we've got to ask if, uh, if it's going to be possible for uh, domestic law enforcement to have the tools they need to get the information necessary to, to protect us from grave harm. Uh, 